Good evening, everybody. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Wishing you all a wonderful Sabbath this evening. I hope that you all had a wonderful week. I know that I did. And uh, I'm just going to share a quick praise with you soon. But I just want to ask that you would please share your praises with us there on the Facebook chat. So if you're joining us for the first time um, in this past few months, I do want to ask that you'd please share one thing that you're thankful for, one thing that you praise God for, for this past week. Remember, in James chapter 1, the Bible says that every good and perfect gift, it comes from above. And look, we can praise God for the smallest of things to the biggest of things, for just help in passing an exam or healing us of a disease or some sort of trouble that we've been through that God has seen us through. Look, let's praise God for something that He has been good to us in this past week. So do share your praises and I want to ask and encourage you to please write it down there. Please share with all of us. I'd love to hear from all of you. It seems like the comments are getting less and less. Please, I, I, I'm asking that you would please share one thing to be thankful for to God for this past week. And I just want to share one simple praise. A few families managed to get away from our church over here in our local church. Uh, we managed to get away for a few days down to Malacca. I want to praise the Lord for a good time. And I also want to praise the Lord for safe traveling mercies. You know, we were out and about everywhere. And I want to praise the Lord for safety as well. So God has been really good in this past week. I've had a wonderful week. And I hope that all of you are praising God as we are entering the Sabbath time together to be able to study together as well. And please, so do share your praises. Do share your praises. And um, I'd love to hear from all of you. If you're not able to do it on Facebook, please share in your church chats. Please share with your neighbor or somebody. Just go around the circle if you're there in a group. I have a group sitting outside in my house there, guys. All those in my care group, please share one praise. And um, if you're not doing it on the Facebook chat there, share it with each other. Something that you are thankful for for this past week. Praise is as much a, a, a part of prayer and it's also as much a part of worshiping God as well. As we recognize the goodness of God, as we understand His mercies towards us. You know, sometimes we say, I praise God for His mercies are new every morning. But do you understand what it means to you personally in your own life? This is where praise becomes really, really important. So please do share your praises. I would love to hear from you. And I hope you're not getting sick of hearing me saying this, but I do repeat it every week. And I'd love to hear praises every week in every session, okay? And uh, today we're going to be continuing our study on the faith of Abraham. So we looked last week at the faith of Sarah. We started Abraham two weeks ago. And today we're going to close up this little portion and the story of what we find in Hebrews 11. But before we do that, I want to ask that you please bow with me as we offer a word of prayer before we open the Bible. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you so much for this Sabbath day that you brought us into. Thank you, Lord, for all that are able to come together to as we, we study together. Lord, I'm just so thankful that you led us through this past week. And now as we're about to open your word, we ask for a blessing, the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And as Solomon asked for wisdom, Lord, you promised in James chapter 1 that if we lack in wisdom, you are more than willing to give it liberally. You won't hold back and you won't upbraid. You won't make fun of us, Lord, because we know that only spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So, Lord, please grant us your Holy Spirit now as we open your word together. Guide us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to continue the story of Abraham. Let's go there. Let's turn the Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 17. Hebrews 11 verse 17, the faith of Abraham. And I've entitled this with a subtitle, The Ultimate Test of Faith. Hebrews 11 verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, 
offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In order to understand this, we have to go back to the book of Genesis. And this is probably the greatest test of faith that God has ever placed on any human being, apart from Jesus, of course. But as we look into this, you're going to see why. So let's go back to that Genesis account, how Abraham was instructed to offer up Isaac. Genesis chapter 22. And I'm sure that this is a familiar story to most of you as you're listening this evening, but I pray that you would still be able to learn something from this story as we dig in. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And he sent to him Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Tain out thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Look, why did God have to test Abraham like this? He comes to him, and not, not only does he say, off, I want you to offer your son, but I want you to offer that son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. God knew that Isaac was special to him. Are you all there? I don't know if the connection has been restored. I don't know if my video is cut off. I saw that my internet connection disconnected all together. So uh, if, you're, if you're there, please uh, say, say something. Uh, say uh, everything is good, please. Um, I don't know if I need to restart the stream. So are we all there? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I don't know where we cut off, so I have to go back just a little bit and um, Okay, wonderful. So, look, I want to go back to Genesis 22. Look, why does God have to test Abraham like this? Why does he have to ask him to offer Isaac his only begotten son? The only one to him, because even though there was Ishmael, God had made it very clear that Ishmael was not the one. Why did God have to go to the extent to tell Abraham to sacrifice his son. Look, we can look back on it today and go, oh, that was a good object lesson for us. You know, the father offering Jesus Christ. And for us, we, we can see this in a sense and a figure of what Abraham had to go through. But why did he have to do this? Look, Abraham had failed the previous test. You gotta understand this. Abraham failed the previous test of faith. God came to him and said, I'm gonna make your, 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 your family as the stars of heaven. You're gonna have so many children, you can't count them. And what does he do? He goes off, his wife says, no, not through me. Go to Hagar, Ishmael comes out. Abraham failed that test. And even though 13 years later, God comes back to him and says, Ishmael's not the one. You're going to have Isaac. And Abraham goes and sleeps with Sarah. Look, he still failed the test, the original test. So before God could fulfill his promise and his covenant that he made with him in Genesis 12, where he said, I want to bless you. I'm going to make of you a great nation. And through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Before God could fulfill that covenant, in his life, he had to make sure, he had to make sure that Abraham truly trusted him. So God had to test him again to see if he really believed his word this time, because the last time he didn't. And even though Isaac came out, look, God made it abundantly clear. It's going to be through Sarah. It's going to be about this time next year. You can name him Isaac. That was no faith. 
There was no faith in that, in a sense. There was here and there, but not to the extent that God was expecting of him when he told him in Genesis 15 that he was going to have a son. And his faith faltered and at Ishmael, you see. So why would this have been such a difficult test? When it came to Genesis 22, now to offer his son Isaac. In Genesis 17, let's turn our Bibles there. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 19. Genesis 17 and verse 19. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. God made it abundantly clear in Genesis chapter 17 that it would be through Isaac that this covenant would be established. And now God comes to him five chapters later in Genesis 22 and he tells Abraham, what? Now I want you to to sacrifice him. Now, I want you to kill him. How would you harmonize these two words of God? To, to give you certain, a, a little glimpse of an example of what we are trying to mean here is this. Look, God says, I want to bless you. If you follow me, if you give tithe and offering in Malachi chapter 3, that's a promise. I will pour out the windows of heaven. There won't be enough room to receive it. So he says, if you give that, but, but then he says, what? I want you to keep the Sabbath. So you're working this job and now you've got to quit. With no job in sight, it's, maybe it's a lockdown like now. And the only way to support yourself, you're thinking, I have to keep this job. And if I don't keep the Sabbath, if I don't go to work on Sabbath, I don't go to work on Saturday, then how am I going to be able to keep the Sabbath, you see? Um, and, and keep my job, I mean. So how do you harmonize these two things? God wants you to be faithful. There's a command. And then there's a promise. How do you harmonize these two things? God, how are you going to bless me if I don't have a job? And sometimes our faith falters, you see. And so look, there was a promise from God. Through Isaac, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Then there's the command, kill him. They both came from the same mouth. The command and the promise came from the same mouth, from the same being, from the same God, and yet they seem to contradict each other. You see that? I'm gonna, he's, he, he's the promised one. I'm going to establish my covenant with him. Now kill him. How, if you were Abraham, would you have reacted? Well, the pen of inspiration tells us that he went back to that tree where he met the three strangers that were passing along, but nobody came. Nobody. He didn't tell his wife. Why? She probably would have stopped him. All we read in Genesis 22 was Abraham got up, he obeyed, he left, and he went. Let's keep reading verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both of them went together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they went, both of them, together. How it must have pained the father's heart to hear those words from his son. And it wasn't just as he was walking up the hill. You know, this was three days journey. In verse 4, it says, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the mountain off in the distance that God said, this is the one. Abraham had three long days to contemplate, to think about it. God, are you sure this is what you want? Is this what you said? And he could have doubted. You know, sometimes, friends, sometimes the more we think about it, the less likely we are to do it isn't it? Especially when it comes to God. If you're struggling with your money and your finances, and oh, should I put it in or should I not? And the more you think about it, sometimes, more often than not, 
we are less likely to do it. Abraham had three days to think about the act that he was to perform. A burnt sacrifice was something that he probably did every day. The burnt sacrifice is, is you know, in, in the Hebrew culture, in the Israelite time, where they, they had the sanctuary and they had these sacrifices and they would bring the sacrifices for different reasons. There are four types of offerings that the Israelites would bring. The burnt offering was not one for sin. It's for consecration. I'm consecrating myself to God. And God had asked Abraham to offer Isaac, his son, as a burnt offering. Every day, most likely, Abraham would have offered this type of sacrifice, if not at least every week. You know, every day we reconsecrate our lives to God, isn't it? This is one of those sacrifices. We give Him everything, our whole heart, our whole life. And this time, the burnt offering was to be his son. You know, I, I, I find myself that I probably would have reasoned things out. God, if I offer Isaac, how, of course, the obvious one, how are you going to establish your promise? That promise you gave me. He could have thrown it back in God's face and said, no, you're the one who gave me the son. It was obvious. I'm not going to do it, God. Or if I do it and I start sacrificing my son, people are going to hear about it. How would that make you look, God? Well, you know, friends, we've got to let God worry about His own image, eh? We just make sure we learn to obey His commands. There could have been many, many reasons He could have given. But yet, He didn't. He didn't. What did He do? He got up, He went, and even though he had time to think about it. What does the Bible record here? And Abraham, verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, oh, verse 9, And they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in all, all order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. You know, every time I recount this story and every time I share, I'm always amazed at the obedience of Isaac, his son. Abraham was certainly well advanced in years. Before Isaac came out, Abraham was old enough to come to this point where he himself could not have children anymore. Certainly he was a weak old man in a sense by this time. His son could have easily overpowered him and ran all the way back home. But when Abraham told him this story, this, this command that God had told him to do, he willingly laid down on the altar. I'm amazed at the, the sort of training that Abraham was able to, to teach his son. That sort of obedience, unquestioning obedience, something even Abraham had to learn. This was the experience. He, he didn't know why, but he went ahead. And if Isaac asked Abraham, Dad, why does God want you to offer me as a burnt offering? If there was no logical answer, he could have just gone home, right? It would have made Abraham look crazy. And we've seen this before with Abraham part one, the faith of Abraham part one. We've seen it with Noah. We've seen it with many people who's learned to live by faith already. These sort of reasons that God gives, sometimes it just makes no sense. God, if you... If I'm faithful to the Sabbath, how am I going to support myself? How? If I lose my job? How am I going to find a job if I don't get my, my degree, if I, I lose my scholarship, if I, I'm just kicked out of the course, I'm not able to pass the exam? And sometimes the only answer that we get is silence. Is the command clear? Yes. But sometimes and many times, friends, we 
are waiting for another door to open before we go, okay, God, now I see why you don't want me to take the exam on Sabbath. You got a better way. But with Abraham, that door never opened. Not until he had his knife stretched out over his son, ready to kill him. That knife was ready to be brought down. And only then did the angel come and probably restrained his hand from plunging it down to his son's chest. That he says, now Abraham, now I know that you fear me. There was no good reason. There was none whatsoever except God wanted to test him. And that reason was not given until later. Friends, if there is something this evening that you already know from the Word of God, from the commandments of God, that God says, I want you to obey, then it would do us well to just move forward. And sometimes only the answer comes after you move forward in faith. Had Abraham just stayed there under the tree and waited for the, the three men to come by, they would have never come. Had Abraham prayed and fasted and prayed and fasted, an answer would have never come. From the time that God comes to him at the beginning of Genesis 22, until Abraham has his hand outstretched to kill his son Isaac, nothing but silence. The voice of God came, offer your son Isaac, and then only later, now I know that you fear me. Silence, three days. I'm sure Abraham must have been praying. And sometimes, friends, silence is only what we get from God because the answer is all too clear already. And you know, friends, that's the thing. Many people, they come to me sometimes as a pastor. Pastor, pastor, I need your advice. And, you know, sometimes it's, we're hoping for a different answer. We're hoping for something that a pastor, a religious man would, would give me to excuse me from this and just, let me do it, even though God says no. And that's a very dangerous situation to be in sometimes as a pastor, you know, guiding people even though they already know the answer and they don't like to hear it sometimes. Why? Oh, I already knew that. As if, good one, Ben. You haven't told me anything different. But friends, you don't need to go to people for advice if the answer is clear. Yes, I know the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. But when the Bible says, thou shall not lie, that there's no way around, don't lie. You don't need to go up to anybody and say, hey, this situation, sh should I lie or not? No, friends. If the Bible is clear, by the grace of God, let us learn to move forward. But you know, friends, what was it that enabled Abraham to follow through this. Yes, it was faith. By faith, he was strengthened to do this. But for three days, Abraham had this opportunity to toss up in his mind. Should I? Shouldn't I? I'm on the way. Okay, but why, God? What's going on? And you know what strengthened him along the way? Why was Abraham brave enough or, or strong enough to follow through with the command of God. How was he able to harmonize in his mind the command of God versus the promise? How is he able to bring these two together, go, okay, God, now I know why you're doing this. Through Isaac, he's, he's going to be the one that will bless the whole world. Now kill him. How is he able to bring these two things together? Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go back there. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 19. What was it that gave strength to Abraham to follow through with God's command? Yes, it was his word. The command was very clear. But you know what reason Abraham gave? Hebrews 11 verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. What was Abraham thinking as he was walking for three days and he says, okay, I'm going to obey God. And God, the only way that you can harmonize these two things, your promise and your command is this. I'm going to kill him. You're going to resurrect him. Now, when you look at the first 21 chapters of Genesis, okay, 
Genesis 22 is where Abraham goes with Isaac to offer him on Mount Moriah. If you look at the first 21 chapters, do you see anywhere there is a resurrection? There isn't. The only thing that we have is translation. Enoch walks straight into heaven. There was no such thing, at least not in the first 21 chapters, that we read of the book of Genesis where there is a person that dies and God brings him back to life. So when you look at Hebrews 11, okay, and verse 19, and it says there that he accounted that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, that was something new. It was something new, friends, something that no one had ever seen. No story had ever been told Abraham that somebody died and had been resurrected back to life. And there they are. There they are standing there. There was no such history book. There was no such record. Something that came in, the, whatever came into Abraham's mind, it was something new based upon trying to harmonize the two words of God. One a promise, one a command. And friends, you know when it comes to following God, we like to be pessimistic. We like to be realistic. You know, we like to think of the worst case scenario so we aren't disappointed, isn't it? But in the case of Abraham, the only, I mean, the very least he could think of was this, in order to harmonize these two statements. God, I'm going to kill him. You're going to resurrect him. That's what he was thinking. Friends, it's time our faith starts thinking in the positive. Not able to pay your tithe? Well, look, look, here's the thing first. Some of us, we can't pay tithe or give offering because we're living beyond our means. You understand that? So don't go, okay, God, um, I'm earning 1000 and uh, my rent is costing me 900 and, uh, you know, I'm going to give 100 anyways. No, friends, what you should start off with is what? The general rule of thumb, 30 to 40 percent max is your rental, 300. I'm going to look for a place for 300. What we should go is, God, you got to give me a place for 300, but I'm going to put in my tithe first and I'm going to move out. Okay, that's what we got to do. We got to do as much as we can humanly possible to make sure that we can live within that means in a sense. But then, and only then, we can test God's promises. You see that, friends? So there is a part for us to play in a sense. But in this case, with Abraham, there was nothing. He'd done all that he could. The command was clear. He moved forward. And so, friends, it's time our faith starts to think in a positive manner. Sure, if you've got to quit your job because uh, it's causing you to lie, it's causing you to break the Sabbath, the command is clear, but move forward on it right away if you know it's wrong. Don't go, okay, God, I know it's wrong. I'm going to start fasting and praying, and um, I will move my job once you give me another job. That's what the world does, friends. That's not how God operates. He says, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the time that we got to move forward. And if you know that there's something wrong that you're doing, by God's grace, fix it now. Don't wait for the door or the window to open before you say, God, I'm going to move forward. By the grace of God, He's got to give us the strength. He's got to give us the wisdom. He's got to give us that trust to hold on to Him because He knows what He's doing. So look, here, this resurrection, right? You know, there was nothing in the first 21 chapters, but yet Abraham had seen something similar. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. There is something, not a total resurrection of a human being that came back from the dead, but there is something that came back from the dead that Abraham was able to build his faith upon and take it to the next level. Romans chapter 4, 19. Romans chapter 4 and verse 19. 
And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And verse 21, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. You know, there was, a, in some sense, a resurrection that Abraham had experienced and Sarah. It was their both, both their bodies. When Isaac was, was um, promised to come out, both the body of Abraham and Sarah were dead by this time. And so God had to do some sort of a resurrection of their bodies. And it says here that he staggered not at the promise of God. So was there some faith involved? Absolutely, but not to the extent of what we see in Genesis 22. And so Abraham took the situation from his experience with his wife about the birth of Isaac, and he brought it now forward to now when God is asking him to kill his son. And he's able to do that. Why? Because he was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he would also perform. Friends, are you fully persuaded about the Word of God? If you're fully persuaded, you would, you would have the faith of Abraham. You would move forward in all the blessings and the promises and even the commands of God. Are you fully persuaded about the Sabbath? Are you fully persuaded about honoring your parents no matter what they've done to you? Are you fully persuaded about not stealing even though your whole family is going hungry? Are you fully persuaded about not lying even though you might lose your job? Are you fully persuaded? 100%, 200%, not a shadow of a doubt Friends, there are some of you that you, you know about the truth of the Sabbath, but you're holding back. You're holding back. And friends, you are saved by grace through faith. If you're not fully persuaded, your faith has not grasped the promises of God. Maybe it's grabbed some of the things that make sense to you, but when it comes to the things that don't make sense, how do you react? Are you fully persuaded? And look at this, verse 18, Romans 4, verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Against hope, he believed in hope. What was against hope in Genesis 22? What was against hope? It was God's command. Kill Isaac. He believed in hope, the very same thing. Let, let, let's put it in a different way. Who against God believed in God. God, it seemed like he was against himself. He was contradicting himself. Do you understand that? Here's a promise. Here's the command that goes against the promise. Yet the only thing that Abraham could hold on to was the promise. Even though the very God that gave the promise went against it, against hope, he believed in hope. When all things seemed now to go downhill, Abraham held on even tighter to the Word of God. Isn't that so different to our experiences nowadays? When everything seems to be going downhill, we let go of God. God, why did you allow this to happen? God, why did you do this to me? And we like to blame God even. But against hope, Abraham believed in hope. His faith was able to lay hold on the Word of God and grab it and not let go. And then he, I don't think he threw it back in God's face, but he knew that God was the one that promised. He made it too clear. He made it too clear that Isaac in him shall all the world 
be blessed. Look, we know that Abraham went through with the sacrifice, as you read in the story. But the final declaration was what? He feared God. He lived in obedience to the Word of God without questioning, without waiting. It was unquestioning obedience. He moved forward with this. And we've looked at this in our first angel's message study as we study Sabbath mornings. If you missed that, I think you can go back about a month now. We started the Fear God. We looked at the first angel's message of Revelation 14. By the way, we are going to be looking at Revelation 14, the second angel's message tomorrow. Please join us at 1130. But we know that Abraham is the first one to be called the man that feared God. And it's through his experience that we get the definition and the experience. And so really what Abraham goes through should be the basis of our experience as well, friends. Look, sometimes it makes no logical sense to do what God asks us to do. It makes no logic at all. And when you get to that, friends, it's time to start to keep walking. And you'll see, maybe in hindsight, the answer that God gives you, even though at that moment you don't. There was no good reason that Abraham could have come up with to sacrifice his son Isaac. There were plenty of bad reasons that he could have come up with, but um, he still moved forward. Friends, God had to go through with this. He had to test Abraham again because the last time when God came to him with this word that seemed unbelievable, it wasn't Isaac. It was the birth of Ishmael that his faith faltered. And you know, God is merciful. He didn't cast up Abraham and said, ah, I, I don't want to work through you anymore. And I praise the Lord that even in our disobedience, even in our rebellion, even when we know better, God says, my son, my daughter, here's another chance. And he's standing there and he says, I know you can do it. You know, the test of Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, was much more difficult than the test of having the son that was promised in Genesis 15 before Ishmael came along. You know, with every successive test that comes our way, when we fail, God has to give something more drastic. Why? The same test comes again, and we realize now, we learn from it, it requires not much faith as when He first gave it. What do I mean? Look, there are some of you that You've, been never te you've never been tested on the Sabbath until you went to university. There are some that you've been tested on the Sabbath when you were in high school, but most likely the faith of your parents got you through it. They just said, no, you're not going to school. But there are some of you that you leave your home and maybe you brought up in Seventh Day Adventist home, or you converted while in university, or you converted while you're working, and the first test that comes to you about the Sabbath, your heart starts to beat fast. You get really worried. You're, you're not sure what's going to happen. You know, and maybe you're, you're there at, at church on the Sabbath day and you can't think about anything about except what your lecturer is going to say or your friend's going to say or what your boss is going to say the, the Monday when you go back to work. But the second time it happens, it gets easier, isn't it? And that's why when we don't pass the test of faith that God gives us originally, He has to give us something a bit harder. It gets a step harder. And that's what happened with Abraham. That's why God called him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And had he failed the test, what would have happened is his heart would have gone just that little bit harder. Until what? The voice of the Holy Spirit is no longer heard. Friends, what I want you to realize today is that God is trying to lead you in this journey of faith. Tests will come. They'll come to everybody. All our tests are different, so don't look at your neighbor and start comparing about, God, why is my life more difficult than theirs? 
all things work together for good to them that love God. All things. We don't need to compare. We don't need to say that person had a better life, so that's why they're more faithful. And so I'm allowed to be unfaithful because I had a more difficult life. Oh, no, friends, definitely not. Jesus was a poor man and lived a carpenter's life, and yet he lived a blameless life. He never gave an excuse for sin. And he lived in one of the most wicked cities called Nazareth. That's why um, when one of the disciples said, could, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? They were surprised that even the Son of God, the presumed Savior, would come from such a wicked place. But Jesus never gave poverty as an excuse for any sin that he was allowed to do. You know, I had friends that turned to me and says, Ben, I grew up in a poor family, so I'm allowed to act like this in a sense. I never had the things that you had. Or, you know, and, and we feel entitled to live a certain way sometimes. But that's not the right mentality. All things work together for good. All things. And sometimes you don't see beyond it. I just want to share a story in closing. You know, when I was a young kid, <clears throat> I'm the youngest in the family. I have a brother ahead of me and a sister and then myself. And as younger brothers do, they idolize their older brother. And that's what I did. You know, everything my brother had, I wanted to wear. Whatever he did, I wanted to do. The hairstyle that he had, I wanted to copy. Obviously, for those that know me, that's not the case today. But when I was younger, that's what happened. And I knew, well, actually, my mother knew this as well. And it just so happened that my hero, my brother, at a young age, in his teens, he went to university and he got into the bad crowd and he started going clubbing and then he started doing drugs. And guess what? My mom kicked him out of home. You know? She locked the door, changed the padlock, changed the key, wouldn't let him in. And um, I was really angry at my mom. <laughs> I was really angry why she would do that, you know. Until I came back one day and I, uh, you know, the house that we were living in was uh, just a small little unit at that time. And it was a very small place. And I came back looking for my mom and I couldn't find her. She was in the laundry crying. And I realized that you know, she, she was crying and said, Ben, what have I done? What have I done? And all I could do at that moment was just give her a hug. And I knew that from that moment that my mom really loved my brother, but she had a really important decision to make. And she was thinking about me because she knew that if my brother went to drugs <clears throat> and went clubbing, that I'll probably follow the same path as well. You know, friends, sometimes we don't see beyond just the circumstances of our narrow-sighted human mind sees. We just see our present circumstances. And maybe some of you right now, you can't see God. How can this be good for me? How can you tell me that this is for my best good? When it seems like you're just angry at me, that you want to, you know, me to feel pain or fe feel discouraged or just be tested. God, is this a test and why, you know? But friends, all things work together for good. God wants to bless us. He wants to give us the very best as a father does to his son and his daughter, willing to give heaven and earth to their children. What parent wouldn't? And the father in heaven wants that as well. And maybe this evening you're discouraged and you're going through a few things. I want to remind you that our Father in heaven loves you very much. He's got a mansion prepared for you up in heaven. He's got the very best waiting for you. And He wants to give you the best on earth as well. But in order to do that, we've got to learn to step out in faith. We've got to learn to take His hand and say, I will follow you wherever you lead me. And even if I'm on the valley of the shadow of death, I know that you're with me and I don't have to fear any evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Friends, let's learn to follow God 
in the good times, but especially in the tough. May God help us all to have the faith of Abraham, to have his experience, to learn to talk with him face to face, to trust him, even when we don't understand the reason why. May God bless us all and teach us how to exercise our faith today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, help us. Help us to see your word in a different light this evening. Help us to realize that this book that you've given to us and these words that are written in there are all for our good, is all calculated to give us a blessing. And Sometimes, Lord, we don't see it. So I ask that you give us the eye of faith to behold that, to look beyond our present pain, our present circumstances. Help us to hold on to your word and to you, and to not let go no matter what happens. So Lord, please be with my brothers and sisters out there who might be suffering this evening. And some of them are self-inflicted from what we've done in our own lives, but some of us, we're going through a, a, a sort of trial because we're following you. And it seems like our road has gotten thorny and more difficult. Help us to trust you e even more and not let go. So Lord, guide us to that end. And when you bring us back up onto the mountaintop, Help us to look back and understand the reason why you allow these things to happen so that it will give us greater confidence and trust to follow you through the valleys again in the future. Lord, please bless us this evening as we retire for the night. Watch over us and keep us in good health and strength until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. Thanks for joining us this evening. And I hope that you'll join us tomorrow at 11.30. Just a reminder, no more Sabbath school. The Dakis will have their Sabbath school in the morning. Sakis will have their Sabbath school in the afternoon. But let's all make sure to use our time wisely to walk closer with God this day. God bless you all and have a good night. See you. Happy Sabbath.